visiting Canada and I was very proud and thankful that my uh, book that came out three weeks before the invasion called Russian Nationalism and the Russian-Ukrainian War was awarded by the Peterson Literary Fund um, yesterday, 1st of December, um, as, it's, uh, as the best book of the six in the shortlist. Um, I think it's uh, the, the reason for that, um, I could, and don't get me wrong, the other books were very good as well, is that it's um, probably the only book um, that's available at the moment that explains why. Because I think many, many people were, are very conf were very confused, continue to remain very confused as to why in 21st century Europe there's such a brutal invasion and such a brutal war um, based on 19th century imperialism and 20th century fascism. I think the best way to look at this is to divide up the, the Vladimir Putin time in office, and you know, even though there's been musical chairs, he's been prime minister, president, he's been in power basically for 22 years. And there, there have been three what I call critical junctures, which means that Putin's shifted to the right on every occasion. The first one was after the Orange Revolution, um, when it led to a kind of a xenophobic backlash against what uh, the Kremlin, what these former KGB officers in the Kremlin believed was Western um, interference, Western conspiracy against Russia to support the Orange Revolution. I mean, these, this kind of mindset can never believe these are genuine protests. They always have to be backed up by the CIA and Western intelligence services, and they always have to be anti-Russian. Um, this led to the sort of creation of things like the Russian world, the Ruski Mir, 2007, the unification of the emigre Russian church and the Russian Orthodox Church in Russia, and, and culminated in this period of time in the invasion of Georgia in 2008. Um, during this period of time, Putin decides that when he is going to come back in 2012 as the new back to the presidency, he is going to implement and his gathering of, of Russian lands, by Russian here I mean Eastern Slavic, <clears throat> and he's going to therefore enter Russian history as the, the gatherer of Russian lands within this so-called Russian world. And, and he begins that as soon as he comes back in 2012. Um, the pressure is laid on not only Ukraine, Armenia as well, Armenia actually falls into line, leaves the EU association agreement, moves and joins the Eurasian Economic Union. Um, Ukraine, there was tremendous pressure on Yanukovych, and of course that led to Yanukovych saying he's not going to sign, and that culminated in the uprising called the Euromaidan Revolution of Dignity. What we've got during this period of time is a transformation of, of nationalism in Russia from Soviet to basically Tsarist imperial and white Russian emigre. So the nationalism that has emerged or is emerging at that stage is actually worse than anything that was in the Soviet Union. And that's something that we have to take into account. In the USSR, Russians and Ukrainians were described as separate people, but of course brotherly people, fraternal people, who were always going to live together because they were brothers. <clears throat> but nevertheless, Ukrainians were a separate people. Ukraine had a so-called sovereign republic in the USSR. It was a founding member of the UN <clears throat> in 1945 because Stalin got three seats at the UN. And even the Ukrainian language was recognized. Of course, there was political repression, denationalization, Russification, no question. But what has happened is that that's been discarded in favor of, from 2005, a Tsarist white Russian emigre viewpoint where there is no Ukraine. There are no Ukrainians. This is all a fiction. This is all a fiction created by the Austrians in the late 19th century, then the Poles, and then Lenin, when he formed the Soviet republics, um, and of course, more recently, it's the EU and CIA. So a very weird bunch of uh, people, you know, Austrians, Poles, Lenin, CIA, EU, but there you are. And so we've, we're re we've returned to what's 
in Russians called the Obshiruski Narod, the pan-Russian nation, composed of so-called, composed of great Russians, little Russians, and white Russians. And, and so when people kind of got wind of some changes like this happening, it was as late as the summer of last year when Putin published his long um, essay on the unity of Ukrainians and Russians. But in fact, this gestation and dehumanization of Ukraine has been taking place for at least 15 years prior to that. Um, Putin and Kremlin leaders have been talking about um, Ukrainians and Russians as one people for a very long period of time. And what, together with this, you had two things. You had the reburial of the remains of white Russian writers and generals. Now, these were all active in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. They were fascists, anti-Semites, and Ukrainophobes. But you also had, more importantly, the republication of their works, people like Ivan Ilyin. And these republished Russian white emigre works, which denied the existence of Ukraine and Ukrainians, were circulated among schools, uh, regional leaders, political elites, and, very importantly, inside the Russian army. So before the genocide we have of today, you've had 10, 15 years of the dehumanization of Ukrainians in the Russian media and Russian sort of political literature. Um, <clears throat> that's important to understand, because that genocide that's happening today did not come from nowhere. Just like with the Holodomor in 1933 and the Holocaust in World War II, you need prior to that a period of dehumanization, whether it's Ukrainians in the 30s or Jews and Roma people in, the, in World War II. This then can be brought up to the modern day, to the invasion. It was never, it was always very strange that only 175,000 troops w were planned to invade Ukraine in this so-called special military operation. 175,000 is nothing. An, invasion, an invading force is supposed to have two to three times more than a defending force. Ukraine at that time had about 400,000 security forces, army, national guard, security service, police. So it wasn't even half of what Ukraine had. The reason why the number was so small was because the people in Moscow, including Putin, had been drinking their own Kool-Aid. They really did believe that Ukraine was populated by little Russians eager to be liberated from repression and genocide by a small cabal of Nazis who had come to power during the Euromaidan and were kept in power by, them, by Washington. This was the mythology behind this ridiculously planned special military operation. And hence why Russia has completely failed to secure its objectives. It never understood the country of Ukraine. It always assumed wrongly that this was kind of little Russia. Um, and, um, and didn't understand that this is a country that's evolved and nation-built for the last 30 years, and that it would fight back. Um, one reason for this is that Putin's FSB, um, when they recruited people in Ukraine, they recruited people who told them what they wanted to hear. They told them about these little Russians eager to be liberated, when in fact we have seen since 24th of February that not a single region of Ukraine has welcomed Russian troops, not a single one. Um, and so, like in 2014, the majority of Ukrainians, irrespective of them being little Russian, being Russian speakers or Ukrainian speakers, means that they are not going to be pro-Russian. Um, one of the um, fallacies in the West, amongst experts and in Moscow, is that if you're a Russian speaker in Ukraine, you're somehow pro-Russian, um, or you're going to collaborate with Russian invading forces, and that's, that's never been the case. One of the things, one of the important areas that Russia failed to understand about Ukraine, besides national identity, was that Ukraine's a very different society to Russia. Russia is a re-Sovietized and re-Stalinized, the cult of Joseph Stalin and the Putin, um, and 
the Russian people are subjects. They're still slaves and serfs. They're not citizens. They don't feel they have any agency. They live in a completely hierarchical society, and that includes in the military. They're fighting a country which is composed of citizens. Ukraine has had three revolutions since 1990. Ukrainians feel themselves that they do have agency. That's why there's a huge civil society, volunteer movement, veterans groups, and why Ukraine is more a horizontally organized society compared to Russia's very vertical organized society. In Ukraine, you had uh, de-Stalinization, de-Sovietization, de-Communization, and now you've got de-Russification. In Russia, it was the exact opposite. And this, this, all of this impacts on, on the military in, both, in, both, in both, both cases. The Russian army of today is basically, or de facto, the Soviet army. There's no, it hasn't changed one iota, despite what Western experts claimed, it, claimed, it, claimed was the case. Um, and their officers are terrible and corrupt, and the soldiers don't, are not trained, they don't have logistics, and they simply don't know how to operate um, in, a, in a military environment where, say, an officer's been killed and they're out, they have to have initiative. Uh, Ukraine army is very different. It's trained according to NATO standards. Uh, they, you have NCOs, which you don't have in Russia. You have officers who are trained to adapt to local situations if, you know, whatever. Things change quickly on the battlefield. They're flexible. They operate in small units. Um, and they're, of course, supplied far better than Russian forces. And this will be decisive um, in the winter of this year when Ukrainian forces um, will be wearing winter clothing. They'll have winter, winter accommodation food and support from locals, and the Russian troops will have none of that. I think um, that explains to a great degree why Ukraine is winning the war. Why Ukraine soldiers have high morale, they're after all fighting for their own land, um, and why Russian soldiers really, on the whole, don't know what they're fighting for. Um, and Russian, and particularly the new wave of mobilized Russian forces are simply not trained. They're cannon fodder, or in Russian, they're just called miaso, meat. And the death rate is just astounding. But of course, we shouldn't be surprised. Putin is a sociopath. He doesn't give a damn about the lives of Russian, Russian soldiers, um, like he doesn't give a damn about the lives of Ukrainians. And hence why it doesn't trouble him that it's close to 85,000 Russians who have been killed on the battlefield. Now, one reason that's so high is that Russians don't collect their wounded. Ukrainians do. And Ukrainians have things like tourniquets to cover wounds. The key period of time when you're wounded is the one, two hours after you're wounded. If you are not patched up then, you're going to die. Ukrainian soldiers are patched up. They also carry their own tourniquets and they're sent back to the military hospital. Russian soldiers are left to rot as they're wounded. And they die an agonizing death. And nobody gives a damn in Russia about that. We should also, of course, mention that a key, another key factor, domestic factor as opposed to foreign, is that Volodymyr Zelensky has proven himself that he's a great commander in chief and, in fact, a Winston Churchill. Many of us were doubtful about this prior to the invasion. Ukrainian opinion polls were doubtful that, that, that Zelensky would rise to the occasion if there was a war. But he's proven us all wrong, and I don't have a problem in, in saying that. Russians, of course, expected to win the war in Kiev in two to three days. They were, the, their soldiers who were, went to Kiev were issued with parade uniforms to do this grotesque victory parade on the Khrushchev, like Hitler's Nazis in Paris in 1940 and they expected Zelensky to run. So none of what the Russians expected actually happened. Um, the other, uh, besides not really understanding how Ukraine would react to an invasion, Russia completely miscalculated the Western response. Now here it's partly the Western fault. The West did nothing after the Georgian invasion of 2008, no sanctions at all, the sanctions imposed in 2014 were pathetic. 
on these, both of these occasions sent signals to, to Moscow that they can get away with stuff. They can get away with it. And they can buy elites in the West. They've got oligarchs there spreading money around as well. Um, they miscalculated that completely, particularly countries like Germany. They really did think Germany had been bought, you know, with Nord Stream 2 and such like. So that was, that was um, I think, a big shock for them. And the fact that Ukraine's getting this weaponry, it also shows to what degree Ukrainians as a people are very resilient and adaptable. They can learn to use these sophisticated NATO weapons quicker often than Western soldiers. One thing you should also throw in here, and very important, is the war has led, as all wars do, World War I and World War II, by the way, did as well, um, empowering women. Ukraine has now about 25% of its uh, armed forces are women, of which about 10% are on the front line. Ukrainian uh, women are fantastic snipers. Women in general are snipers. They're more patient, I guess, than guys. Um, that's, that figure of 25% is higher than Canada, America, and Britain. Inevitably, that will lead to greater empowerment of women after the war is won, as it will with civil society and the volunteer movement in general. Ukraine's volunteer movement is just simply astounding. Um, there's no other way to describe it. Often led by women as well, but not only. Um, it really is involved in all sorts of areas that you wouldn't think of, um, in terms of also military equipment, anti-drone, uh, food, logistics, you name And the amount of money being raised by Ukrainians and by foreign foreign countries, Baltic states, Poland, elsewhere, is just also good. Ukrainians are also, Ukrainians and their foreign supporters are also great as this so-called Ukrainian cyber army, bringing the war into the Russian media, into the Russian, Russian TV. I think that um, one factor here that should be mentioned at, in, in, at the end is to what degree Western so-called experts got this all run, wrong as well. It's interesting how um, Western so-called experts, um, think tanks, academics, also believed, like in Moscow, that Ukraine would only last two to three days. And people say, well, that isn't important. They don't have influence. I disagree. They do have influence because they influence government ministers. They influence policymakers. Policymakers don't go out and study these issues. They're, t they're advised. They, they're given executive summaries of, 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 of these issues. And, and that's why many government ministers, Germany, France, um, United States even, less, not with Boris Johnson in Britain, um, actually did believe Ukraine wouldn't last longer than three days. And therefore, there wasn't any point in giving Ukraine heavy weaponry because Ukraine would, would be defeated. Then we just have to give Ukraine weapons for guerrilla warfare, for partisan warfare. This was wrong. So what they got wrong was twofold. They exaggerated the strength of the Russian army, ignored the massive corruption in the Russian army, which has now become legend, um, literally legend. I mean, I have so many examples that, that could be shown uh, about this. Um, and they underestimated completely the Ukrainian response and Ukrainian strength, resilience, and national identity. They over-exaggerated Ukraine's regional divisions, believing that Ukraine was a weak state and would disintegrate or kind of collapse um, very quickly, and Russian speakers would kind of side with Russia. So they got, they got that wrong as well. And, and that, to me, shows that there needs to be a reckoning amongst you know, those, those experts, those so-called experts, who got everything completely wrong on, 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 on these issues. I think as we're going through winter, I think what we should be thinking about is two areas. The firstly, I mean, when are we going to eventually see maybe some more vic victory success? I think winter here, because usually when we think of winter, we wrongly think that usually works in Russia's favor um, because we think of World War II and, and Napoleon. We tend to forget that when the Finns defeated the Russians in 1914 in winter. I think this winter will work in Ukraine's favor. Um, Ukraine soldiers will be better equipped, better, better supplied than, than the Russian fighting for them. One can see a situation where Russian soldiers will simply be unable to fight.
um, because of the weather, um, particularly sort of months such as this December, January, January and February in particular. What is taking place, and I'll finish on this, what is taking place um, at the same time as this is, um, of course, massive destruction of Ukraine's energy system. Hopefully that will be rectified by, by the Western supply of, of generators and, and, and help to re, rebuild Ukraine's energy system, and also um, the provision of air defense forces. Um, so hopefully that will be blunted. Russia is only using missiles and, and drones against um, Ukrainian utilities um, only because they're too afraid to fight Ukrainian soldiers on the battlefield. So hopefully that will be dealt with, shall we say, by the end of this year when all of Ukraine is covered by air defense. President Zelensky said it's about 80% covered now, i.e. in terms of knocking down uh, missiles and, and drones. Hopefully it'll be 100% by the end of the year. Um, so then that, again, will help to turn the tide um, in Ukraine's favor by the spring of next year. And I think here the key battles will be eastern Kherson and southern Zaporizhia. Um, and once Ukraine has, has liberated those two regions and its high Mars are standing on the Black Sea coast, Crimea is lost to the Russians. Because once those um, Western weapons are on the Black Sea coast of, of, of southern Ukraine and they can hit anywhere inside Crimea, Russia is really going to be uh, therefore defeated. So let's look forward to that. Thank you.